so I'm super excited. I, I graded the test. I haven't uh, figured in all of the uh, attendance points and everything. I'm trying to bring everything up to date, all the grades. And so I'll be working on that after class. And and so, um, yeah, it was, you know, two days ago. So I don't remember all the anything. Nothing stood out. So I guess that's good news. <laughs> then, um, <clears throat> But I'm really excited. This is the last part of the course. And this is where we then take all of the information that we've crammed in our heads about wave functions and apply it to the most complicated part of the molecule, like actual big molecules. We start with diatomics, of course, because those are the easiest to understand. You just have two nuclei and the wave function around it. Um, we set up some terms like bonding and antibonding orbitals, which are really easy to understand when you have two atoms. But that terminology just gets blown up when you go to bigger molecules. So even though we'll establish like a sigma and a sigma star, pi and a pi star, it gets real difficult to understand those in larger molecules. There are certain cases like with the um, delocalized pi cloud or something where you could say this is a pi and a pi star, but mostly when you get to a molecule, it's a molecular orbital. And so it's not easily classified as a pi or a pi star or a sigma or a sigma star. And so we'll explore all of that. But um, but I love this part of the course. I also like it because there are certain things you learn as a freshman that we're going to totally blow out of the water. And that's always fun to see your faces. You're like, what? I was lied to, you know. And so you weren't lied to, but we'll understand how we compare theories. So there's some really fun stuff in this last fifth of the course. So let's talk about molecular bonding and structure. Uh, up to this point, you've been well versed and taught local bond theory. So that's your Lewis dot formulas, um, the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, where you let everything repel and go into three dimensions. And that's where you get the hybridization, SP, SP2. So this all rings a bell because this is what we've been using for our molecular structure so far. So we build a molecule, we think about it, structure, and that's how we find the point groups, right? These are local bond order, Vesper shaped molecules. And you're good at that hopefully now, right? You can draw a molecule and using local bond theory. So what does local bond theory tell us? Like how is a bond made in a Lewis dot formula? What defines a bond? So let me just, I'll just draw water here. Okay, so if I'm gonna draw just the Lewis dot structure of water, we draw lines, but really it's two electrons. Remember that? So the hydrogen shares, the oxygen shares, and we have the non-bonded electrons. So what's the local part of local bond theory? Just look at that molecule. What, tell me what you think. We're working on our classroom engagement and they're like, make sure you give the students long enough to answer. <laughs> yeah, the location of what? That's it, it's the electrons. The electrons are local to the bond. So it's, it's in the name. So they're saying if there's a bond between these two atoms, those electrons are in that locality. So that, just really hammer that into your head, that in local bond theory, every bond has two electrons associated with it, and those electrons are between the nuclei, and that's what's holding the nuclei together. Now contrast that with molecular orbital theory. Okay, it matches the UV photoelectron spectroscopy and the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy data. And it's simple for diatomics and complicated for molecules, okay? Um, <clears throat> but think about molecular orbital theory. So if we draw water, I'm just going to draw, I'm not going to draw the bonds on purpose because I'm trying to emphasize that it's not local. It's an orbital that goes over the whole molecule like this. And that contains two electrons. So 
it's spread all over. So just think of these these two words, molecular orbital, right? It goes over the whole molecule. That's one orbital over the whole molecule. All three atoms are in, enveloped in that, and that has only two electrons in it. Versus local bond theory, which says between each atom that's bonded together, there's two electrons that are like between the two nuclei. And I mean, local bond theory does make sense, right? You have two positive charges and you got two electrons right between holding them together. So it's, it's convenient to think about and say, well, that makes sense. I've got two negative charges holding two positive charges together. But uh, we go to the data and the data matches molecular orbital theory. So... Where? Oh, yeah. So we'll see later. Then there's, there's, um, so this would be like the, all the S orbitals in phase with each other, but then you might have the P orbital on oxygen and the hydrogen S orbital and this hydrogen S orbital. And then that would be a molecular orbital. And there'd be two electrons in that one. Yeah, and so you just add in how many electrons you have in all these molecular orbitals and you end up with the same shape of the molecule. Yeah, and it's totally not local, <laughs> right? So that's, I guess that's what I really, before we even begin doing MO theory, I want you to really think about when we're talking molecular orbital, like that should jump off the page. It's an orbital over the whole molecule and it's made up of atomic orbitals. The P, a, P orbital of the oxygen, the S orbital on the hydrogen. We combine all of those atomic orbitals and make a molecular orbital and then the two electrons are spread over the whole thing. Yeah, it's quite a different picture. You've been using these sort of inorganic, they draw orbitals and stuff like that. But that's this part of the course, really we're gonna dive in and understand it. And that's, I think that's fun, okay. So all, we'll start with homonuclear diatomics. They're all D infinity H. So this is the D infinity H uh, character table. Pay, pay close attention to this column right here, the beginning column, the first column. You know, this was the, these were the first molecules studied. They're the simplest molecules. And they started out with these capital Greek letters for, for their Millikan notations. And it got, I mean, it got kind of, it got impossible basically to continue to use that. And so then they started using for the bigger molecules, A's and B's and E's and so on. So we've been using these A1's and B, B1's and B3U's and so on and E1G's. And so I've just, I've just made a little key here to show you that the Sigma G plus is really A1G and that's top row. Sigma G minus is A2G. And so I've sort of got a little translation here. So um, this is what I will use. Okay. And then the main column that you'll use in this character table is just the inversion center. So we'll be trying to decide whether an orbital is G or U. And so you would want to look to see um, you know how it how it shows up in terms of this this inversion so you would invert you take a point on the orbital and we'll see how that's done and you'll determine if it's a plus one or a minus one under inversion and that will help you decide whether it's a g orbital or a u orbital um, and then light of course all of these things over here we have um, light z x y so light is u as it is in all the other character tables um, we also have the P orbitals, the PZ and the PXY. Um, and then we have the D orbitals, although we won't really do much with them um, in the diatomics. But when you get to inorganic, you're going to need the D orbitals. So we would have, again, the different D orbitals, we have E1G orbitals, E2G and A1G orbitals. So let's make our first molecular orbital diagram. Molecular orbital diagram for H2, the simplest molecule. Now notice the blinky parts. Okay, let me do that, make them blink again. So remember that these are the expanding and contracting clouds. So these are S orbitals, so they expand and contract. If they expand together, 
then there's no node in between. If they expand in opposite or out of phase, there's a node in between. And remember that the expanding and contracting pieces is kinetic energy. And let's draw this one in. And there's a node here. And so we can look at this and we can say, well, this, this bottom one, there's no node. And so it's a much larger box. And we know from the particle in a box that if you have a bigger box, the energies drop because the length is in the denominator. So this has got a larger box. And so it's got lower energy than either of the two atoms. So we bring two atomic orbitals together and mix them. You get one that drops and one that goes up. If you bring in two atomic orbitals, you get two molecular orbitals. So the number of orbitals is conserved. So how do you know how many orbitals in the middle? It just depends on how many atomic orbitals you bring in. If you bring in five and five, then you're going to have 10 total in the middle. Um, this one up here, it's got a bigger box, but it's also got a node. And so the higher curvature means it's higher in energy. So just like our wave functions, this bottom one sort of has a, you know, if I were to go along the z-axis, it kind of looks like this. And then this one along the z-axis goes maybe down and crosses zero and goes up. Now we can write kind of a shorthand for the wave function. So you don't have to worry about this normalization factor, but that's the normalization constant when you bring in two atomic orbitals. And anyway, uh, this is the main piece here. It's the 1s on atom A plus the 1s orbital on atom B. So do you understand the designation? And this plus means in phase. And so it has the same shading pattern. They're the same shade when in, in time they, they track each other. And then up here we have a designation, the 1s orbital on atom A minus the 1s orbital on atom B. So these are called linear combinations of atomic orbitals. So you just plus and minus the atomic orbitals. And this means out of phase. So it means they're not interacting. So if they have the same sign, they're interacting. If they have the different sign, they're not interacting with each other. So we're going to use these little shorthands a lot because you don't have to always draw pictures. You know, that's, how would we write it out on a text line? We'd write it out like this. 1SA minus 1SB would be the antibonding one. And then 1SA plus 1SB would be the bonding one. Okay. And then these atoms come in with one electron each, uh, we sort of take all of those electrons, like we don't necessarily bring them in, both spin up. We sort of just take the electrons and then fill the MO part from the bottom up. So we could put the first two electrons in the bottom and we would pair them up. So the poly exclusion principle still applies. So we can only put two electrons in an orbital. We can't put a third because they would have all the same quantum numbers. Quantum numbers for the molecular orbitals are I don't know of a I don't know of a scheme. So there's no principal quantum number and angular momentum quantum number and M sub L and all of that. We have those for the atoms. Once we get to molecules, we really don't have quantum numbers. There's quantum states, but we don't really have an easy way of, of numbering them. So um, we'll show several numbering schemes, but there's not like this universal numbering scheme that you can just learn and, and know. Okay. And so this energy difference is the energy difference for a given geometry. If the atoms are closer together, the energy difference gets farther apart. If you start to pull the atoms apart, this energy difference gets, gets smaller and smaller until it merges to the atom energies. So as the atom energies come together, the, the molecular orbitals get further apart. So as the atom is, is vibrating, this energy difference is kind of oscillating. So there's a little bit of, of vibration electronic coupling because 
the nuclei are massive. They're a thousand times heavier than the electrons. And so as soon as the nucleus moves closer together, the electron cloud instantly reacts. Okay, so it's, it, remember the Gaussian uh, lecture where I had the guy with the bees or the gnats, you know, that, that, that no matter where the golfer moved or the construction guy, the gnats were able to keep up. Same thing with this. If the nuclei are moving like this, the molecular orbitals are doing that. They're pulsing up and down. And that's why these peaks are so wide in the, in the spectrum. Because you take a snapshot with light, some molecules are close together, others are farther apart. And so the absorption peaks are, are, are low res, if you will, big broad peaks. Um, here's a picture of the potential energy surface and the, the bonding and antibonding orbitals. So like if you were to excite uh, the electron up to, to this uh, antibonding orbital, you would have this potential energy curve. And if you were in the, the bonding one, you would have that potential energy curve and the difference is the difference between those two. So as the molecule oscillates, the energy difference oscillates. And then we can label these. I've got all kinds of stuff in the way. Let's get that out of the way. So from the character table, we have the following labels for our orbitals. And that's going to really serve as a part of our labeling scheme, is the symmetries of these orbitals. So A1U for the, for the antibonding and A1G for the bonding. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll compare that to the character table in the future. Any questions about this? this is the simplest one and we're done. <laughs> Okay, it took 20 minutes. We won't take that long for all the others. <laughs> okay, so then now let's talk about how P orbitals come together. So P orbitals are much more interesting than the S orbitals. They can come together end on and make a sigma type interaction or they can come in side to side and make a, a pi type interaction. So if these bonds come together and they're in phase with each other, and now when I say in phase, I said it's the same coloring pattern. Well, it's a, a pattern that can interact. So I would call this in phase because they're interacting with each other. So, And then if, they, um, if they're in phase, the overlap is favorable, making a bonding molecular orbital. If they're out of phase, the overlap is zero, making an antibonding. So let's sort of plot this um, wave function here, this part's negative, so it goes down, and then it crosses zero at the nucleus. So the nucleus is right there. Then it goes up, and then between the, the nuclei, it goes back through zero again. And then at this nucleus, it goes through zero, and then it comes back out like that. So this would be our wave function, just plotted in one dimension for the electrons. Does everybody see what the plus minuses mean? They're not charge, they're, they're the wave function phase, right? And, and right here we have this node in the middle, and so there's a node that breaks the bond. And that's what makes it an antibonding molecular orbital. Okay, so the node breaks the bond, which, which is what we mean by antibonding. Think about when we, um, when we, it was back to the quantum mechanical postulates. We said that when you square the wave function, that that's the probability distribution. So wherever the wave function is moving, the kinetic energy part, that's the location of the electron. You square that. And if there's a node in the middle, it means there's less electron density between the nuclei because it's a, there's a node there. And whereas over here, you know, it might, here's the nuclei right there. You know, this one goes down and then it goes through and then there's a, there's no node between the bond. And so you have all that electron density between the nuclei. And so that's why it's a bonding orbital. 
So if there's no node between the bond, you could say for those two nuclei, that's a bonding interaction. And for if there is a node that breaks the bond, then that's an antibonding interaction between for those two nuclei. Now, we only have two nuclei in a diatomic, but when we get to water or more complicated molecules, there might be a node that breaks this bond, but not that bond. And so we can't decide whether it's a bonding or antibonding. We have to say for these two nuclei, it's bonding, and for those two nuclei, it's antibonding. So it gets more complicated when you have more atoms, but for a diatomic, it's either or. It's either bonding or antibonding. Okay. Here's from Gaussian. You can really see that that when we bring these p orbitals together, I kind of think of it as uh, as water droplets or water and oil, like the red is oil and the green is water. And when it gets close, it like sucks together. And so there's a whole lot of electron density in between the nuclei. So they don't come together and still look like p orbitals. Like when they come together, they change substantially. And in fact, this antibonding one, this is really not accurate. It probably looks more like this. Um, where you've got a, a tiny little plus piece, a tiny little minus piece, and a huge plus piece on the outside, and a huge minus piece on the outside, right? So there's very little electron density between the nuclei and a node that breaks it. So this is probably more accurate like this, where it, it goes through the middle. Right, so then that, you can really see how that's antibonding. There's just no electrons between the nuclei, so why would it hold those two nuclei together? The electrons are on the outside. The nuclei then can see each other. The positives hate the positives, and so they push apart, and so that would really be an antibonding situation. So the way we draw these is a little difficult because you're not picking up on there being very little electron density in between the nuclei. So Gaussian can help us in that respect. Now let's look at, well, everybody get the sigmas. What makes this a sigma? The p orbitals are coming in on the ends. They're touching the ends. They're aimed at each other. Um, the pi's, look how the pi bonds interact. The p orbitals come in side to side. And so the two dumbbells, they call them, they, they come in side by side and they interact sideways. Okay, so here are the nuclei. And so if they come in and they're, um, they're out of phase with each other, then there's a node. And here there's no node. So the one on the right is, a, is bonding and the one on the left is antibonding. Okay. It's not as easy to plot these in one dimension because <laughs> it's definitely a three-dimensional shape or two-dimensional shape at least. And so it's difficult. Um, and notice here we have uh, we didn't really talk about centers of inversion on the last one. Let's do that real quick. Let's look at this one down here. So here's our two nuclei. If I pick any spot on this um, on this wave function and I go through the center of mass, so that's the COM, center of mass. I go through that spot to the other side of the orbital and look, it's still negative. Everybody see that? So that that means it's garata. It's even. And it could be any spot. I could have picked something in the positive region. I could have picked this spot right here and gone through the center of mass and seen that it was positive on the other side. So it's in all directions through the center of mass. What is on the other side? If it's the same shading, it's a it's a G orbital. What about up here, if I take, um, yeah, on this one, if I pick a spot right there, go through the center of mass to that same spot on the other side of the molecule, it's different sign, so it's odd. And that's a U. Important skill, because when we do the selection rules, you'll need to know if it's G or U.
Let's look at the P, the uh, pi and pi star bonds. That's what's going on here, the center of inversion, the center of mass. If we start here and we go over to the other side, we end up with the same sign of the wave function. And so that means that's even. And if we start here and go to the other side, we see that we've changed sign, so that's odd. Okay. So I'm going to write this out and then tell you about it. So a uh, common misconception of students that miss this on exam after exam is that they think that G and U means bonding or antibonding, and it doesn't. It just means even or odd symmetry. In this particular case, these are in phase with each other. Okay, right? So this, if this is like a water drop and an oil drop, these are going to suck together and make a huge area of negative phase and this will suck together and make a huge area of positive phase and this would be a u orbital but it's bonding and this one they're not going to be in phase with each other so they're not going to suck together they're going to sort of repel each other and that would be anti-bonding and it's g but if we look at the sigmas up here this one was u and it was anti-bonding this one was g and it was bonding so it's just the opposite so g and u do not equate to bonding or anti-bonding Okay, so just get that out of your head right now. <laughs> the bonding or antibonding is whether there's a node that breaks the bond. So if there's a node that breaks the bond, it's antibonding. If there's no node between the two nuclei, it's bonding. Okay. And so then this down here would be the two um, p orbitals out of phase or not interacting with each other. So the two p orbital on atom A not interacting with the 2p orbital on atom B, so that would be the antibonding one. And then here they would be interacting. So the 2p orbital on atom A interacting, so we have the positive sign interacting with the 2p orbital on atom B. So those are the atomic orbitals, and we use those to make the molecular orbital. And then here's a picture of what Gaussian. See how they suck together and make a large molecular orbital? And so this, and it has a nodal plane, okay, that that contains the bond, but both of those, both the bonding and antibonding have this nodal plane. We're talking about the node that breaks the bond being how we determine whether it's bonding or antibonding. So this would be the, the pi uh, orbital for nitrogen. And then here's all three. So we have the sigma bond with the end on interaction of the PZ orbitals. And then we have the PX and the PY making the pi bonds. Okay. And so here it's sort of, I've shown the same molecular orbitals at two different shadings because it's kind of hard to tell. But yeah, you can kind of see the one on the right looks better on the screen. The one on the left looks better on my laptop. So I just put both on there. And so that's what the, uh, molecular, the bonding molecular orbitals look like in dinitrogen. So it's definitely not local bond theory, <laughs> right? They're not, you know, six electrons just between the two nitrogens making a triple bond. There's six electrons spread over this whole cloud um, of electrons, and they end up having the same effect of making a triple bond between the nitrogen. Let's go to helium. If we bring helium together, it's the same thing. It's the 1s on atom A, the 1s on atom B, positive interaction, opposite interaction, bonding, antibonding, A1g, A1u. But now we have four electrons. And when we bring those in, we populate them. We have two electrons in the bonding. We have two electrons in the antibonding. And the net 
bond order is zero. So we can talk about bond order. So it takes two electrons to make a bond. We kind of pull that over from, from uh, local bond theory. And so we add up the number of bonding electrons and subtract the antibonding electrons and divide by two. So this is two bonding electrons. And this is two antibonding electrons, A, B, E. And so we end up with zero over two. We have a bond order of zero. And so that's why helium doesn't make a diatomic. If you look at the periodic table or, you know, you, you know about your atoms, you know, F2, O2, N2, those all make diatomics. We get the helium that's not helium-2 or neon-2 uh, because of this situation. We have just as many electrons in the antibonding as we have in the bonding. And so the molecule comes together. If they collide, the electric electronic orbitals will probably associate this way. They'll either be in phase or out of phase, but the electrons will go with those and make an antibonding potential energy diagram, and then it will dissociate. So as the nuclei come together, this is instantaneously formed, and then it dissolves again because there's no benefit for the two helium atoms to be together. Okay. Let's look at fluorine. It got complicated fast, didn't it? <laughs> so we're out of the 1s block. Now we're in the 2s and 2p block, and we're all the way over to fluorine. If we had, if we had just two more electrons, look at this open orbital up here. If we just put two more electrons on there, we would have uh, neon, di-neon, and we would have just as many non-bonding electrons as we had bonding electrons. So we'd have a bond order of zero, and so it would dissolve. But here's how all of the orbitals come together. So we have the, the, you know, down here, it looks just like we had for hydrogen, the, the 2s on atom A plus the 2s on atom B, and the 2s on atom A out of phase with the 2s on atom B. Notice that the 1s orbitals are not here. So no core electron orbitals. I'm going to put three exclamation points on that. And I get frustrated always looking at freshman texts and freshman homework assignments because they will mix in the 1s orbitals on this, and it's totally wrong. Yeah. This is valence shell. We use valence electrons to bond. We don't use core electrons to bond. So it's always and only the valence electrons. Those are the ones that are out at the frontier of the atom. And so when they come together, it's only the valence electrons that are making these molecular orbitals. So the 1s orbitals are on the atoms. The 1s electrons are on the atoms. Uh, they're really close to the nucleus, and so they're not able to bond. So it's only those frontier or orbitals. Then we have the, the A1g, which is the um, 2pz on atom A and the 2pz. How do I know z? Remember, if we're going to make a diatomic, uh, let's, let's draw it up here. So we have... F bonded to F, and that's the symmetry axis. And so our Z axis is the axis of the molecule. And so then we have to do our little counterclockwise thing. So that means X is going up and Y is coming out. Okay. Does everybody follow that? The molecule's axis is the Z axis because that's the symmetry axis, the C infinity axis. And, uh, and so then we have the X, Y, Z. So then we have the um, up here, the 2pz on atom A out of phase with the 2pz on atom B. So do you see how um, we've got these? Notice this one down here, we start with zero nodes. Then we have one node, and then we have three nodes. No, there's not one there, sorry. Two nodes. And then we have up here three nodes. And this one, because those three nodes are right next to each other, boom, 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 boom. That's a lot of curvature to the wave function. And curvature is energy. The more a tightly a wave function curves, the higher the energy. And so you can look at that and say it's got three nodes. That's the most nodes. Uh, that's the most curvature. So that's going to be the highest energy orbital. Instead of drawing it like right here, right? It's got so much curvature, it's way up there in energy. 
and we see this a lot of times the the s the 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 end on interactions of the pi uh p uh, orbitals will really create a drop in energy and a really high energy orbital And so then those those orbitals are those those different levels. We call them sigma and sigma star. So the sigma, the sigma stars are the antibonding ones. Uh, like I said, there's really no um, set way to to number these. And so this this number two here, and this three, and this three, I've seen it labeled one, two, three, four. I've seen it. You know, and why do we start at two? Why is it a one pi? You know, there's no scheme for that. So you're not going to lose points labeling this one down here one sigma G. <laughs> or, you know, so it, the sigma G, you got to have. You got to know it's a sigma bonding. You got to know it's G. And sigma U star, you got to know it's antibonding. You got to know it's U. You got to know it's a sigma. So those are the things you'll be tested on. And so these are doubly degenerate because there's a px orbital that can interact and there's a py orbitals that can interact. They have the same energy. So we have 2px of atom A interacting with 2px on atom B, 2py on A, 2py on B, both in phase with each other, both bonding side on. And then we have the 2px out of phase with uh, A and B and then y out of phase on A and B. And so those are the antibonding. Those are E uh, designations in the character table indicating that they're degenerate. So it's two energy levels that have the same energy. We draw them a lot of times like this, where it's just two closely spaced energy levels. But I don't really like that as much. I'd prefer it like drawn like this energy level and that energy level so that they're side by side with a gap. So you see that they're the same energy. Okay, but I'm pulling some of these figures from the book. So I get what I get. So this is the traditional MO diagram, starting with oxygen, fluorine, and all of the higher ones. When we do lithium through nitrogen, this there's some monkey business that goes on right here, okay? And so let's look at lithium through nitrogen. Oh. Well, maybe not yet. <laughs> okay, just a second. So anyway, we have these different, um, this is oxygen, same kind of thing as fluorine. Um, it, and it's, it's sort of this same pattern. So we did fluorine, and then we did oxygen right next to it. Um, and so this is just exactly what we've gone through. Now here's nitrogen, and we see there's, there's some funny business right here. That sigma G is above the pi u. And that happens because these atoms are so small. So there's not a huge energy difference between the two p's and the two s's. And so the two p's and two s's actually interact with each other. And that's called um, uh, L sp mixing. So the s's and the p's are mixing a little bit to form these strange looking atomic orbitals as they come together and make the molecular orbitals. And so this is this is what's going on here. These are the four sigma interactions. You see that all of them have some P-type character, meaning they have nodes on the nuclei, right? So that's a P-type interaction. Whereas down here, there shouldn't have been, like if we go, to, go back to fluorine, see there's no nodes down here on the, on the atom part. This is just pure S. But when we get to nitrogen through lithium or lithium through nitrogen, we have this SP mixing. And that's what causes this, these two levels to swap places, okay? If you don't understand why, that's fine, join the club. We know this happens only because of the data, right? So we went to the spectroscopy and those levels were switched and we're like, why? What could possibly be the reason? Well, maybe the S and the P orbitals are mixing because these are such small atoms. So, so there's nothing in your intuition that would say, oh, of course. <laughs> Right, you're not. That's not coming from our knowledge, except that our explanation is that maybe these atoms are so small that the s and the p orbitals are close enough to to interact with each other, and it's just waves, waves interacting with waves. Okay, so those are all the sigma interactions. Uh, same symmetries as before. 
Here are the pi interactions, same symmetries as before. And so here's the MO diagrams for the whole second period. So if you look at this, um, do you recognize this, what I've drawn here? Like, let's, uh, let's look at this box right here for nitrogen. Do you recognize what's being drawn? If you go back a slide, it's this piece right here in the middle. We're not drawing the atoms piece, we're just drawing the molecular orbitals. Somebody got it? So that's for the whole second row. We have all of those middle pieces, all those molecular orbitals drawn. So every one of those diatomics has its own little box of, of molecular orbitals. And here we see that SP mixing, that red level going down. This A1G level is that, that, that pi, uh, no, no, not pi, but the sigma bonding of the P orbitals. And it, and it, it goes along here uh, from lithium it goes along here to nitrogen, and that's the SP mixing piece. And those are the only five diatomics you have to worry about. The rest of them can be drawn like O2 and F2. So when we do chlorine or uh, bromine or iodine, then we can draw it like fluorine and we'll be fine. Okay, it'll just be the three or the four or the five SMPs, not the, not the, um, yeah, yeah. instead of the two S and P's. Okay, let's look at some of the other things in this diagram, the bond orders. So we could calculate the bond orders of all of these things. So it's the number of uh, bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons divided by two. And so here's what we get. Uh, here's the antibonding orbitals. So you see the little stars. So we can add up the bond orders and here's what we get. So for dilithium, yeah, can actually get dilithium as a as a bonded molecule. And so Star Trek was close, right? The dilithium crystals. I don't know that they'll, give you, they'll generate a lot of warp speed power, but they do exist. But diberyllium doesn't, okay? So we have the same number of electrons in the bonding and antibonding orbitals. And so it's not a stable interaction, the bond order zero. Um, we could go to, to boron. We have a bond order of, of one. Uh, notice that these, because we have this degenerate energy state, we have unpaired electrons. And so experiment confirms that that uh, diboron and oxygen are paramagnetic. They have unpaired electrons. And so those unpaired electrons can make the molecule magnetic in a magnetic field. So if you put, if you liquefy air, so we have uh, nitrogen and oxygen in, in our atmosphere. If we liquefy air and run it through a magnet, the magnet will hold onto the oxygen and the nitrogen will pass through. And there's some dem demos on YouTube. You can look at that. So look at the paramagnetism of oxygen and you'll see them pour liquid oxygen between a magnet and it'll get stuck between the poles of the magnet. It's really cool. Here's a, it gets more complicated. The diatomics were easy. This is uh, hydrogen peroxide. I, you know, I'm just showing it to you just, just for grins and giggles. Okay, uh, but yeah, you come in with the, the, so this, the O2 piece is kind of like how you would bond the two oxygens together. So this ought to be familiar. If you look at that, it looks like an MO diagram for O2. And then we mix in the two hydrogens in phase and out of phase, and we can make the molecule. So this is kind of how we do it for symmetric molecules. We'll just build the molecular orbital diagram up with, um, with all of the different symmetry adapted linear combinations of the atomic orbitals. And so we'll get into this quite a bit. Uh, for this course, I would like for you to be able to look at a molecular orbital compare it to the character table and come up with the symmetry, okay? Now let's um, look at the, the last little bit, last slide. Uh, we have the bond order up here at the top, which is the theory, right? This is, uh, we just mixed wave functions from atoms and we came up with bond order. And then we go to experiment and look at the data, look at the bond energy. So if we break these molecules apart, look how beautiful that is. It fits the theory pretty well, or theory fits the data, I guess. Um, and, and what's cool about that is that it um, also matches in the bond length, 
for the most part. It's not a linear function. So yes, nitrogen has a smaller bond length than oxygen and carbon, dicarbon, but not by much. But still, the higher the bond order, the shorter the bond length. The higher the bond order, the higher the bond energy. And then the force constant. If you have a really strong bond, high bond order, then you ought to have a tight force constant, the spring of that vibration. Let's look at, at dicarbon, so C2. <clears throat> if we use local bond theory, as uh, each carbon has four electrons that it brings in, and it needs each one needs an octet. So we would make it like this. It would be a quadruple bond so that each carbon in a covalent situation could claim an octet, and it would be a quadruple bond. But our bond order, molecular orbital theory, predicts that it would only be a bond order of two. So we've got a, we've got a discrepancy. Is, uh, is the local bond theory right in the octet rule where we have a quadruple bond for C2? Or is our molecular orbital theory right where we have a bond order predicted of, of two, not four? So local bond theory predicts a bond order of four. And molecular orbital theory predicts a bond order of two. And then we go to the bond energy and look where the bond energy is. So the bond energy confirms the molecular orbital theory is correct. And so it's, it's saying that local bond theory is not supported by the data. So anyway, that's interesting. That's just one example of where local bond theory fails. And, and so we'll get into that some more. Um, this is a great Kahoot. Uh, we don't have time for it, but you know, go to uh, Kahoot and type in Kim underscore prof uh, and you know four 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 eight. Search for those quizzes, and you'll find the one on on uh, molecular orbitals.